Good evening. Um, my name is Irene Kikandis. I have a joint appointment in German Studies and Comparative Literature. I'm actually here tonight as a member of the steering committee of the War and Peace Studies program. Um, tonight's screening of Stephen Ging's film, Syriana, is sponsored by uh, the War and Peace Studies program of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm delighted to see some people I don't know, so I just wanted to make sure everyone knows our director, Ken Yalowitz, um, who's right here in the front. And tonight, we're very lucky to have um, two special people associated with this film. Uh, this is Georgia Kakandis, who was one of the producers of the film, and Robert Baer, who wrote two books on which uh, the film is loosely based based, and he served also as a consultant for the film. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Georgia and Bob after the screening, um, but without any delay, we'll go to the screening. I'll tell you a little more about Georgia and Bob, and they'll be available for questions and answers afterwards. So welcome, and thanks for being here. Well, I'm sure we have very full heads right now and full hearts. Um, I did want to tell you a, a little bit more about our two guests, and um, then I'm going to start some questioning myself, if that's OK with everyone, and then uh, we'll open it up um, to the floor. Um, Robert Baer, uh, to my left, studied at Georgetown University, from which he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Foreign Service in 1975. He then joined the Central Intelligence Agency in 1976 and served tours of duty um, for more than 20 years in locations such as India, Tunisia, Syria, the Sudan, Lebanon, France, Morocco, Tajikistan, Iraq, and Bosnia. Um, his language skills in Arabic, Farsi, French, and German must have helped him quite a lot in these locations. And as a German professor, I'm sure it was the German that was uh, the most useful of all. But Bob will, um, <laughs> will tell us about that later. Uh, since leaving the CIA, um, Bear has published three books with Crown Publishers. Uh, the first, See No Evil, The True Story of a Ground Soldier in the CIA's War on Terrorism, appeared in 2002. And that's the book. Um, which is referred to here in the film. But it, the work, I understand, also relied on Bob's second book, which was Sleeping with the Devil, How Washington Sold Our Soul for Saudi Crude, which appeared in 2003. Uh, most recently, Bob has published Blow the House Down in 2006. Now, while writing these books uh, and publishing articles in um, journals and newspapers such as Vanity Fair, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic Monthly, The Washington Post, Newsweek, and The Nation, Bear also served as consultant for the film we've just seen, um, also for ABC News in Iraq, and for Britain's Channel 4 documentary series, The Cult of Suicide, The Suicide Bomber. Um, right now, he's serving as a columnist for Time Magazine, in addition to being occasionally called to testify in places like Washington, DC, which is what happened the first time we tried to schedule this event. So Bob, we're really pleased you're here. Welcome, and thank you very thank much you. for coming. Um, when I describe Georgia Kakandis' career uh, to people who don't know her, um, I usually say that she started by fetching coffee as an unpaid production assistant. And she worked her way up each step of the production chain to producer, working along the way uh, with some of the greatest filmmakers of our time, and quickly not only <coughs> getting paid herself, but also deciding who else would be hired and how much they would get paid. Um, way stations in Georgia's apprenticeship in the film industry include um, DOA, Mystery Train, several films with John Sayles, uh, including Eight Men Out, City of Hope, and Passion Fish, um, two with Steven Soderbergh, King of the Hill, and The Underneath, uh, one with Martin Scorsese, Casino, and two projects with Francis Ford Coppola, um, The Rainmaker, and Megalopolis. Um, Georgia has also worked on several other films in various capacities, including most recently as the executive producer of Tenacious D and The Pick of Destiny. She worked also on Ted Demi's Blow uh, and Criminal. Um, she was also the co-producer of Andrew Nichols' feature, uh, excuse me, feature debut film, Gattaca, which is a film we use here in uh, many of our classes at Dartmouth, including my own 
Women's and Gender Studies 10 course, Introduction to Sex, Gender, and Society. And I know the Ethics Institute has used that film also. Um, another film which I heard a lot about was Girl Interrupted, uh, directed by James Mangold. Um, Georgia has served in many different capacities in the film industry. Her current title is Executive Vice President of Physical Production at Paramount Vantage, the new specialty division of Paramount Pictures. Uh, where she has worked since January 2006, shepherding forthcoming films from the Cone Brothers, Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, Noah Baumbach, and others. Um, I wanted to relate one personal anecdote. It may not uh, have escaped your notice that we have the same last name. Um, Georgia is, in fact, my sister, and I feel very um, humbled uh, by all she has accomplished. Um, when I was in Germany for the first time after a certain number of years of absence. I had a German friend who is a member, actually, of a family that our family knows very, very well because our oldest sister, we are two of six children, our oldest sister had lived with this family in Hamburg, Germany, many, many years ago. And the oldest sister in that family um, never ceases to retell me the story of how she met Georgia at our home in White Plains, New York, one time. And Georgia looked very young to Elizabeth and said, I'm going to make movies. And Elizabeth seemed rather skeptical, but she said Georgia was so convinced uh, that when she then discovered Georgia had made movies, um, she wasn't surprised at all. Um, Georgia has made many movies, and we're going to ask her to uh, share with us some of what went into the making of this film. So um, let's welcome Georgia as well. And <laughs> And if it is OK with the two of you, I just wanted to start out with one question for each of you. Um, Bob, I'm wondering if you could share with the audience very briefly how we got from See No Evil to an actual screenplay on which a film could then be based. Bob was not actually the screenwriter himself, and I think it might be interesting for you to hear some things about the steps in between. It, uh, the way I understood it happened was that Soderbergh and Clooney wanted to do a movie on oil. And they were looking for a work they could base it on, preferably nonfiction. And Seymour Hirsch, who's a friend of mine, wrote an article in The New Yorker saying this book was coming out. And, and uh, people in California read The New Yorker and Vanity Fair and start getting ideas from that basis. So they contacted my agent. And I met up with Gage and the director and another producer from the film. And we all three looked at each other and said, well, what's the film? And I said, I don't know. Gagan didn't know. The other producer didn't know. So we took a road trip. And I traveled with Steve Gagan around the Middle East for two months. And every story you see in this movie, is there's some basis in reality. Names changed, of course, and you know, sex and race and the rest of it. But there is a basis in reality. <coughs> the first time I saw the movie, it was, it was basically done. It was a screening room in California. And I was going along, and they bring up the question. I don't know if anybody's in oil here of the North Field and South Pars unitizing them in the Persian Gulf and running a pipeline up through Iran. And Gag and I had talked about this, what it would mean for Europe reconciliation with Iran, what it mean for the Gulf and the rest of them and the price of gas. And, and when I saw that in the film, I said, how is this going to work into a, a feature film? And for me, it worked. But um, it was, essentially, this movie is a story about a trip that Gag and I took with real characters. And when we were done, we got to Paris. We were sitting at the cafe floor. And Steve turns to me and says, I don't get the movie. You know, I don't get the plot here. I don't get the arc. What are the issues? And I said, Steve, let me tell you a story. The best I can tell it is, in 1997, I resigned from the CIA uh, with no pension, uh, with no savings. Uh, I had been in Iraq, uh, attempted to kill Saddam Hussein, was stopped 24 hours in advance. Um, I was a federal employee, you know, investigated for murder, among other things. I, I was exonerated, by the way. Um, 
But I do have, you know, I have, I have a letter of declination from the Department of Justice declining to, to prosecute me for murder, which is, it's not exactly you want to attach your resume. So anyhow, we get to Beirut with this sort of resume. No one knows who I am. And, and CIA people, in case you didn't know this, tend to run around with a bit of a rough crowd. And the um, question came up is, would I participate in the murder of a, of a Gulf prince? who was in, had been involved in a coup in his country. This was run through an American firm. And you know, my wife, being very white bread, middle class from Newport Beach, said, this doesn't sound like a good idea. So we got up and left Beirut. But the point was, the theme became a basis for the movie is how far, when you're tempted with this sort of compromise, will you go? And you see this in the Clooney character. He's at the end of his career. He really has nothing to lose, and he's offered a compromise, and then ultimately turns it down, as we did killing this prince. And then the script I, you know, was just written. I mean, I, you know, I just watched it, and I just think, I think the dialogue in this thing is just brilliant. You know, I try to write fiction myself, so I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. Um, George, I was wondering if you could just fill us in that with a big overview about when did you get on board with the project. And Um, the same producer, Jennifer Fox, who was an uh, in-house person uh, for Section 8. I was doing a film for Section 8 at the time called Criminal with her, and towards the end of the shoot, she handed me this big, fat script and said, do you think you could help me figure out how to make this movie? And I, you know, I was like, well, I'll read it. And I got about 20, 30 pages into it, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. And I tried to pawn it off on somebody else. I tried to say, you know, oh, I'll, I can find the right person to help you make this movie. But the more I looked into it and the more I met Steve and um, the more I talked about it, I realized it was kind of a challenge that I would be a fool to uh, pass up. And, um, and what it meant was taking this very dense piece of literature, basically, and figuring out how to form it into the shape of a film and um, and then present it to the studio at such a price point that they would say yes and with enough elements in it that they felt like it was valuable for them. So um, it took many months to get there and we, um, you know, we had different actors that we wanted to be in the film. At one point we were very strong, strongly felt like Chris Cooper should be the lead character. Um, and, uh, and eventually, as we got down the road, and, and there was a lot of resistance to making the film, especially with Chris, that when George Clooney decided that he would play the lead role, that <coughs> gave us a, a nice step towards having it happen, because at that time, uh, Soderbergh was making the Oceans movies for Warner Brothers, and so they had a little bit of incentive to keep everybody happy, and our movie wasn't relatively that expensive, so they, um, they did eventually let us go. But between, between those times, there was just a lot of um, what I do with the, with, as a line producer and a producer is that I take the material and I take the amount of money and I work with the director and you know, with the, the creative people to figure out how to make this movie for this amount of money. And because Steve is such a, um, an elaborate writer and um, somebody asked me earlier about the criticism of the film, like why isn't there more story? You know, it feels like there are, there are pieces of the story missing, and in fact there are huge pieces of the story missing, and huge whole storylines that are missing. Um, but we did shoot most of them. <laughs> um, some of them did have to come out um, before we actually even started shooting, just so that we could figure out a balance and how to make the film for the amount of money that we were eventually given. And um, a lot of decisions had to be made about where we could travel to shoot to have a you know a location look like it was in Tehran and the location looked like it was in Marbella and you know because um, we we could only go to a finite number of countries on the budget that we had so we did end up shooting in um, Texas where they do the hunting scene in the beginning and then Baltimore for Washington and then Washington for Washington. Then we shot in Casablanca for um, Beirut, and no, and Tehran, right? 
Yes, Beirut, Tehran, and also the, um, we also shot the scenes uh, with the clerics, um, the jihadi clerics. And uh, then we went to Geneva for all the stuff that uh, we did with Matt Damon's character. And then we went to Dubai and we shot that whole end sequence in the desert and the, all the scenes with the prince um, and the Arabs. We shot all those scenes there. So. so from start to finish, just time-wise? Start to finish for me was about a two-year period. And then, then, again, because the film was so dense and so difficult to edit together, um, we, once we finished physical production, we went through about four or five uh, series of reshoots. So we were trying to fix different storylines. We tried to fix this one storyline twice. We shot new pieces to it, and eventually, it just didn't work, so the whole thing had to go. Um, and you know, this is this is what happens when you don't go in to filmmaking with a really tight script. And sometimes things just evolve in ways that you can't really control, too, in terms of the director's appetite for wanting to explore a certain story. And as you can see, there's so many stories going on that you can really um, get overly involved in one, and it takes you off your course. And, then somehow you have to get back, so you cut it out. Was about fifty million. I heard the story. You can confirm this. I never talked to you about it. Is that you held back money because you knew there'd be reshoots? Is that true? No. What happened is here's what really happened. What happened is that we had a very the 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 scene that has the oil tanker in it. We shot actually at a real oil refinery in Morocco. No other country on earth would let you shoot in such a sensitive site, but Morocco is such a poor country, and they actually get an enormous amount of filming, mostly out of the UK. So the government is very open and very, um, uh, very cooperative, and they put an enormous amount of pressure on the um, the oil company to allow us to film there. It took a long time, and it and it was a dangerous place to work. There were a lot of things about it that were scary, um, including the fact that. Um, we, you know, we, we, can't, we couldn't figure out how we were going to do this. And the way that, that the refinery worked is that it was basically like a needle. It was like they built out on a rock croppings, and, and the boats would line up to this very small piece of, you know, of a port, and, um, and they'd unload their oil. In this case, it was supposed to be natural gas, but the ship that we ended up using was a cargo container. Ship. So we had to hire at great expense a cargo container ship that was coming out of Greece. And we had to track it as it came across. And it was just at that time of year that these swells come in from the Atlantic. And the swells are so big, and, and they're big enough that they can actually displace the ship. So if the swells had come in during our shoot, um, they would have prevented us from you know, docking the boat, and our entire schedule for Morocco and Geneva and Dubai would have been completely blown out of the water. And we would have had to find new locations, and we would have had to um, you know, do an enormous amount of work to recover ourselves. Because even in uh, Morocco, when we were shooting, it was Ramadan, and um, there was not a lot of flexibility in when we could be in certain spaces. So we, you know, you had to shoot that scene on a Saturday. You had to shoot that scene on a Wednesday or whatever. So we didn't have a lot of options. And um, and in fact, we held back on a lot of money because we knew that if we didn't, you know, if we got screwed over with the weather and that that tanker <laughs> thing, it would have had a trickle down effect that would have completely blown our budget out of the water. But as it happened, <laughs> Steve Gagan is, and we always, we always accredit the director with the luck of the weather. He's very lucky weather-wise, and we had, um, we'd had like some, some cloudy days before, but the morning we woke up to do the first day of the tanker, it was absolutely crystal clear by four o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. It was like the first light of day was crystal clear. We shot everything, went perfectly. Second day, same thing. Everything went off like a hitch. And then we really had, you know, all these savings that we were holding on to that we were afraid we would get screwed there just ended up accumulating. And in fact, by the end of the show, we had quite a big pot. And the reason we kept that pot was because the studio was so against the movie that we didn't want to 
we, we wanted to control it ourselves and we wanted to say, okay, if we need to reshoot something, if we need to get better music that we can afford in the budget that exists, you know, whatever we need, we want to be able to provide that money ourselves because we didn't want to have to go back to the studio and say, do you like this enough? Do you think this movie will make enough money that you'd give us four more million dollars, you know, to do reshoots? And we just didn't want to be in that position with them because we knew how they felt about the film. So, yeah. I'd love to open it up now to questions, and if people could try to be brief so we could get as many questions as possible. Great. After all that, the new version of the budget, did you make money back? It, yes, it did. Yes, it did. It actually, it wasn't a huge earner, but it definitely made its money back. Yeah, and not, not, it wasn't too shabby either. The studio didn't put a lot of juice behind it. They, they, they didn't, Warner Brothers is a big, huge commercial studio. Uh, there are other, like if this had been a you know, Weinstein Brothers release, they would have known how to make money, make an enormous amount of money from that movie uh, with all the sexy elements it had and everything. But, but Warner Brothers really didn't know what to do with it and they kind of, they didn't really position the international releases when they should because it should have been a huge hit internationally and it didn't. They just didn't know how to distribute a film like that so it was unfortunate but that's it. It's life. Anybody else? Yeah. This might be too vague but um, how realistic uh, were some of the more extreme elements in the plot? Which ones? Well, they, they did in Yemen in 2002. There were six people in a car. One was an American citizen. Um, they got a lock on a car, and they actually used contractors for the missiles and the, hell, the Hellfire missiles. So it, it has been used. It's been used extensively in Afghanistan, predators. Uh, the CIA, it, uses predators through contractors because they're smaller than the military drones. Um, they, don't, they don't have color monitors, but it looks better in the film if they do. <laughs> there was a question right behind that, George. Um, I had heard that George Clooney uh, didn't really uh, ask for a, a very, his normal salary because he was so much interested in that picture. In the yes, picture. that's true. Is that true? Yeah, both Matt and um, Matt, Matt Damon and George took, I, I think they were paid about a million dollars. So they, they had a big, I mean, and their normal quotes are about $20 million. So in essence, it's, a, it's an investment in the film <laughs> that they made. And the, but they do, they do get a piece of the back end participate, you know, it's participation for monies that come after the studios recoup their money. But in this case, I don't think that was, you know, a lot of money for either of them. But yeah, they both believed in the film enough to do that. Yeah. I found it very uh, prescient, uh, your, the, the element uh, relatively early in the film of the, uh, in, uh, the uh, activity of, of Hezbollah and uh, it, its influence uh, there. and. Uh, it was shot and in the can and so forth well before last summer. So it was uh, it just uh, just as, as a as a commentary on sort of the accuracy of the the, the dynamics of the of the Middle East and uh, you know I was wondering uh, wondering why the, the Hezbollah wasn't more it wasn't a greater connection with with Iran because you, you you start off the whole movie with Iran. Oh, I don't know. I can't tell you about that because well, first of all. There, there was, we did get Mohammed Hussein Fadlala to give his ideas on the movie. He's the, he's not the spiritual leader of Hezbollah, but he's certainly the senior cleric, Shia cleric in, in Lebanon. And, you know, how do you do, how, what do you do with a, I mean, this isn't a documentary. And Gagan, in one of his wild moments, called me up at whatever time in the morning and says, well, I ain't got an idea, we're gonna make, well, a script is being written, we're going to have George W. announce the invasion of Iran. And, oh, yeah, yeah, and Warner Brothers said, well, this is a little bit over the top. We'll just leave it the way it is. So, you know, it, we, could, we could have been way ahead on this. <laughs> even further ahead. Yeah, even further ahead. So, I mean, you know, the, I, I write fiction now. The problem with, is I think that Gagan, 
who was, was fully, this is his script, had too much information, in a sense. And, you know, I, have, I don't want to write about the Middle East because I have too much information and it becomes a, an intelligence report. And so you do have law firms in Washington that are being used outsourced by the Pentagon, um, by the CIA. They're actually carrying out covert action. I'm sure you've seen this in the New Yorker and the rest of it. But it's a lot for people to absorb because it's not the normal template of a, of a drama. And the, the whole idea of unitizing South Pars in the North Field, um, this, this whole coup thing in Gutter in, in 95 happened. The whole prince is, is a real person. Um, the law firms, and everybody knows, <coughs> in fact, this movie may, in a sense, be uh, get somebody off the hook. It's a guy named Jim Giffen who was dealing in Kazakhstan with Iranian oil. He was, he was swapping oil. So you have so many elements of reality. And when I, when I saw the movie, I don't know how you feel, but I, I understood that the purpose of it was just to leave a sense of dread. What are all these connections? And if once you start trying to make all these connections, and, you know, with the graphs, you're, you're finished. You can't, you know, you don't even want to think about the movie. So it's, it's it, I thought it, that's why I liked it. Because I can't even, I know all the stories and I still can't make the connections in the movie. I would really have to sit down with a, with a line, so like this law firm, this, you know, Iran and, you know, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the rest of it. I meet the gentleman right in front. Uh, Bob, I was wondering if you could talk about what I'm sure was a pretty difficult process of extricating yourself from the CIA, but then probably even more difficult going into writing about sort of sensitive issues, whether it's or being involved with this movie, even if it's in a fictional capacity, the kind of, if any, pressure or pushback that you got from your old pals. Well, my old pals, they, um, it was like everything else happens sort of randomly by accident. I wrote a memoir, See No Evil, and because I was very clever, I, I started this several years beforehand in, in a fictionalized form like Primary Colors with a co-author because I'm not used to writing for entertainment in any sort of way. That fell apart. The CIA refused it. I went out on my own and I wrote this memoir and they said, oh, you cannot use these assignments. You can't describe your cover. You can't describe covert action. You can't do this. And, it just got, it got very crazy. So I, I sent in a manuscript where the middle part of it is full of information that shouldn't be out in the, pub, in the public, but they cleared it. And they didn't, you know, I said, oh my God. I mean, that stuff is just, I mean, I get calls from Israeli intelligence and, you know, about names in there. And most readers just are, are you know, they don't care. But so anyhow. And then I finally get a manuscript, and I send it to them, and they've got 30 days to clear it. In 30 days, they didn't answer. Uh, it got excerpt by Vanity Fair, published two million magazines from the excerpt, and then the CIA sends me a letter saying, do not publish on the pain of death. And I, I called up Graydon Carter at Vanity Fair, and he says, yeah, you count on it. I'm going to pull these things back. And of course, he didn't. But what had happened is they had the anthrax scare. And all letters and everything else coming into the CIA was sent to the Midwest for a, a scan for anthrax. So they missed their 30 days. Well, that's, that's the federal government. You know, what can I tell you? If you've ever worked out, you understand it. It's, it's, it's hard. It's really hard for somebody who does nonfiction to move into fiction. And I didn't, on this movie, I didn't even presume to get involved in how scenes play out dialogue and the rest. I just didn't know enough. So it was very much Steve Gagan's script. You know, I, I wasn't a paid consultant, but I went out to Dubai and helped set up the filming there. And they took him on the trip for two months. There's a story I've already told, and you've already heard this. Syria is not in it, but I'm very close to the Syrian presidency, and they said, fine, we'll help you. We show up in Damascus, and we didn't even know what we wanted from the Syrians. It's an Arab country, but you know, an Arab is not an Arab. 
there are different kinds of era. But anyhow, we said, well, let's meet the oil minister. We're doing a movie on oil. We had absolutely no questions to ask him. Call the presidency, and they say, fine, go see him. Right before we get to the Ministry of Oil to see the minister, it's Thursday night. He wants to go home. He has no idea who these Americans are. Uh, the president calls up on the cell phone and says, you, Bear, are not ex-CIA, and you, Gagan, are not Hollywood. So as we're walking up to see the minister, we say, what are we going to talk to the guy about? So I, I completely faked it. And I mean, you'll find this hard to believe, but you, I have become an accomplished liar working for the CIA. <laughs> but so I pretended that I was an oil consultant, and Gagan was my assistant. And he sat there, you know, taking down notes, and the oil minister. And, and I said, I want to build a pipeline from the Gulf across Syria. And I knew enough about pipelines by then to convince him. And he said, absolutely, it's it's done deal. And then he pulls out 3D seismic. And he says, hey, I got a couple fields for you guys. And Gagan the whole time is just, he wanted to start laughing. And that's the Middle East. And so that's what, what, what the trip helped Gagan was to start destroying these cliches about the Middle East. I mean, the prince is based on a Jordanian prince <coughs> who is one of the most articulate, refined men I've ever met. You know, he's, he's, he's been to, you know, he's got a graduate degree from the United States, he's been to Sandhurst, he writes polo, and he has an art collection is in, in a house that you just wouldn't believe. And we sat, we sat in at um, Monte Carlo in his house, which juts out into a rock, beautiful English mansion just refined, so you get the Arab out of the Bernoulli and the rest of it, and refined, and ideas, and, and, and this was, we, Gagan and I sat with this guy an afternoon. He says, all right, I'm gonna make them into a golf prince. And, and that was really the, my contribution, is how, what a bizarre place the Middle East is. And it's, it's nothing like, I mean, you know, I as an American would learn in this country. But again, that adds to the complication of the film because he wanted to get all that the depth in, and when you have so many characters like that, you're 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 up you know you're into a, toy, a Tolstoy novel, yeah. which is how do you put Tolstoy on the screen? But you also have uh, you know you have a director who has in his mind this vision of. You know, he, he would often start a conversation, well, you know, well, Bob took me to this party, and I actually, I think they have it every year, and would it be possible for us to just bring our cameras there and shoot the real party? <laughs> He'd be like, no, it would not be possible. <laughs> we cannot do that. We can't count on the party being there and ship 100 people there, and what kind of a party would it really be if we were stopping the party every few minutes to, you know, sound record some dialogue, you know? <laughs> But um, so it, in some ways, the trip, you know, it, it gave Steve a really solid idea of what he needed. But we, we had a lot of work to do in terms of getting that to, uh, to realize itself. It, it was a movable feast working with this. We go to Washington, and I have a showing for Congress at Union Station. And at the end, like we're doing now, Gagan gets up and he says, it's so wonderful to be here on Nigeria on the Potomac. It's all congressmen. <laughs> There's just the people are, you know, he, he's a riot. Yeah, he's pretty funny. So the issues taken up in the film are, of course, very, very politicized, but you were also filming in places that were very sem at sensitive moments uh, in contemporary politics. And I was just wondering, Georgia, from a production perspective, what you mentioned about the timing with the ship because of the weather and things, but what were some of the more difficult moments in terms of negotiating what was happening locally or the politics of being a film crew based in the United States, although you had a very international crew in some of these locations like Dubai or Morocco. Well, we had a, we had an international crew for that very reason that we were not sure how we would how we would be seen and whether we would be a big target. You know, being a group of a hundred Americans. Um, in first in Casablanca, um, so we ended up deciding to mostly because Warner Brothers also has a very strong presence in London. So we hooked up with a London crew and they came down and they helped us uh, shoot the pieces in Morocco, Geneva, and, um, and in Dubai. Um, so, we, so we tried to be as international as we could and not, you know, and, and not feel like we're such a big target. I mean, we did have security issues and uh, mostly with George and Matt and both of them had their separate you know security uh, 
details and then we had an overall security guy who watched the production and was in constant touch with the, the local authorities and everyone else um, and uh, you know so security it was the first time I ever did a film where security was one of the most important things to be worked out and and an issue that cost an enormous amount of money at the end of the day um, and it's kind of the new the new way of the world for American films you can't really go overseas well you can go to England and France, and but I think you can't go east of Europe and uh, not expect to have some security issues just because of how Americans are seen right now. Um, and a couple of interesting things happened when we were in. Du well, we we were shooting in um, in Morocco during Ramadan, which wasn't that big a deal because the Moroccans were very loose about it, or at least the Moroccans and. Casablanca at the time, and you know, and we had to make certain uh, accommodations for the local crew. But once we got to Dubai and it was still Ramadan, there were uh, there were bigger issues, and we were lucky that uh, we started in Dubai shooting the sequence um, where the cars exploded. So we were kind of cordoned off, and we were away from downtown, and it, no other cars could come near us. So the local people who were kind of watching us allowed us to eat and drink so because it was 125 degrees outside and we weren't quite used to that so people were trying to keep themselves hydrated but then um, I think it was the second week we were there we spent a week prepping to be there and then when we started shooting was when the big uh, sheikh of uh, Dubai the the what was his name he was the emir who brought the United Emirates together yeah. And he passed away, and um, and it was a little bit touchy, for, you know, touch and go for us because everything stopped. There was an eight-day, just nobody worked, nobody did anything, and um, you know, we were afraid we wouldn't be able to get things that we needed from vendors and um, permits, and we at one point thought that they were going to sh uh, shut us down. But, um, but they didn't, thankfully. And uh, you know, it was the eight days of mourning, and then everything was pretty much back to normal. Um, yeah. There were the like the that. Saudis didn't like the film oh, yeah. because the emir was in a wheelchair and they thought it was King Fahd. They really didn't like that. And his son, I call him the Cretan son, didn't like it either. It's his youngest son. This, you know, Fahd believed that this, if he kept his son close to him because. Um, someone told him, what do they call soothsayer, told him that if he ever left Riyadh without his son, he would die. And so that's the son you see in the, or a, a character of, of sorts. They, well, the Saudis are so sensitive. Well, they didn't like me, so that didn't help. Because I wrote a book about Saudi Arabia. Anyway. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Where did you learn all, all of your languages? It's not I, CIA put me through two years of Arabic, intensive, 16 hours a day. I was the Foreign Service Institute, and you studied, and, and then I became a consular officer for two years where you had to use Arabic. So fairly, you know, four years of constant Arabic. It started to stick after a while. And then you just use it. Uh, as a CIA officer overseas, I mainly, you know, agents or foreigners who spy for the CIA dealt with them in Arabic. And you have to be fairly, you have to have a good understanding, not so much a good speaking level. And, you know, you know, you remember Hume Haran? He was the only, he's the only American I've ever met who, who spoke close to native Arabic. He, his father was Persian and he just a great linguist. But it's, you, have, you need serviceable Arabic, which makes a big difference. And then French, I, I, have, I live in France part, part of the time, and restored a house there. And I had the horrible, the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life was debate with the French foreign minister on television in French. Wow. <laughs> I have a question. Talk about humility. What? It was Villepin, yeah. I have a question for you about, um, you, the disclaimer in the film is that it's fictional and so forth. And yet for you, there are so many connected and, and unconnected truths and stories. What's it like for you to have all of that complexity in a movie in front of the American public instead of 
simply in your book that attracts readers who will want to read it. It's, it seems like it's so much bigger and more complex and in some ways more true to have it in this form because the, to me the mystery of it, the disconnectedness of it adds to the sense that, oh my God, this, this is happening everywhere. Well, if I was a better writer, I would have written this movie <laughs> rather than the memoir I did. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's my memoirs, but not as just, I mean, not as the takes, but a lot of the allusions in this movie are based on suppositions because these are things that I saw and a lot of things I couldn't prove but we knew to be true. And that he, well, I mean, that's the genius of film is putting this up on the screen and, and it getting anywhere close to reality. And a lot, and then, and you're, and then you're fictionalizing things, obviously, because Clooney dies at the end and the prince dies. The real prince is, is put in a basement and injected with drugs until his brain was dead. But that doesn't really fit on the big screen, and you don't have the drama. But to, to, I, I don't, it just, it's, I think it's just, it, it's just marvelous the way you can do that and put it, put it in film, take that reality. Well, you, yeah, and I, I do have to say that there was a whole vetting period where we had to go through and, uh, and, and, and actually make sure that the representations of the real people were disguised enough so that we could avoid litigation it, later. And every single note that Gagan took was given to the lawyers, mm -hmm. asked to say, who is the real guy? Could you possibly identify him in the movie? Yeah. And once they said no, and they didn't allow the script to go forward. It was just absolutely, it was the due diligence on this was incredible. It, well, it had to be. Yeah, it really had to be because it was so close to real people. I think my question really is, to me, it doesn't matter if a particular real individual can be distanced from a fictional char character in the film. My, my wonder is that this is just the tip of the iceberg about all the stuff that goes on. Okay, come on, you, Unical built the road that Bin Laden escaped on. Yeah. What can I tell you? You won't see that in the movie. Known fact, they paid for it, they paid the Taliban so they could build a gas pipeline, the Yashlar Field to Pakistan. And the and University of Nebraska was, was part of that too. Okay, you know, we'll be ecumenical about this. You know, they were, they were paying money to you know, and, and breed us. These, these are just established, and everybody knew it, and no one cared. And they still don't care. And those people, the same guy who built the road, would come into the National Security Council, and I was talking talk about Iraq, and the the you know the senior director asked me to get up and leave the CIA people. They had open access to the National Security Council. Doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, alike. They had badges, in, you know. I mean, not that I'm more important. I'm just, I'm just telling you that the, um, the whole idea of building a pipeline from the Caspian Sea through Turkey took absolute precedence of British Petroleum. Um, and this is, I'm only going to tell you things I can, that have been established in the newspaper. British Petroleum was having a fight with a Russian company, TNK. Soviet Union. Uh, British Petroleum wanted to block, and this is how complicated it is, Halliburton from getting a loan, an OPIC loan, to give this Russian company equipment, half a billion dollars. So what BP did was it went out to some ex-KGB people, made up an entire report about TNK, Halliburton's partner, Dick Cheney's partner. So I mean, it works both ways. Yeah sent it to the White House, who then sent it to the CIA, who put it on CIA stationery as if it was own report, but it was produced by British Petroleum, who then sent it to the State Department, didn't tell the State Department, and the State Department sent it over, denied this loan, they stopped the, house, they stopped, they stopped the half a billion dollar loan to TNK. And, you know, it's, look, it's in the Washington Post, no one's ever denied it, David Ignatius, so if an oil company can write intelligence, put the CIA stamp on it, top secret, 
and lie to the State Department. What else is going on? That's what, that's part of the public record. That's right. what the movie's about. I mean, I don't, I don't know how if this this happened over a you know a couple of Cuban cigars or, or it happened on the metro or where I don't know, but you know it happens. Okay, Abe, we're going to give you the last question. Would you mind passing the? Um, my question is basically just, um, I guess, for a 20-year period, you had incredible access to an incredible amount of information, either through people or reports or what have you. And now, I guess, on some level, you have some fraction of that access. But on a day-to-day -day basis, um, what what do you read? I'm just curious. What do you, how do you get your information now that you're out? per se. Well, two weeks ago I was in Washington. I still keep, this, this is actually sort of scary. I do keep friends. And I went into the State Department, and of course I don't have a badge, and, and I go up to the Iran desk, and they start questioning me what the policy on Iran is. <laughs> because policy has been outsourced to the American Enterprise Institute to consultants, uh, it's in the NSC, and things like that. Um, JSOC is running its own intelligence. That's Joint Special Operations Command, Special Forces, SEALs, Delta, are running their own operations in Iraq. You know, it, it, as far as my conclusion is that policy, intelligence, I can, I can exaggerate this, but I'm not, I'm not sure how much I'm exaggerating has been outsourced. Uh, right now, the CIA spends three times on contractors what it spends on staff employees and salaries and the rest of it. So intelligence is being outsourced. So if, if tomorrow the CIA announces that Iran has a nuclear bomb and we're going to go in, you know, did SAIC make that up? Booz Allen? I, yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Okay. And, and I, I don't think clueless. we're going to be able to end the evening quite on that. So, on Georgia. That, on that positive note. <laughs> on that positive note. <laughs> so, actually, Georgia, I want to pitch you a film question, which is somehow seeing this film with you sitting next to me, it reminded me of the last film we got to see together, which was actually Babel. And I was just wondering if you could tell us, I don't know how many people in the audience have had a chance to see Babel, but it has a somewhat similar structure in the sense that it's several stories that do fit together in a certain kind of way. Is this something where, is this where all feature films are going to this style? No. Um, or is that just one uh, you particular mean the narrative strand? Style? That particular narrative style it's of? Very, it's still very popular. Mm -hmm. It is, multiple stories going on, and you know, sometimes intersecting and sometimes not. It's definitely gonna be with us for a little longer. A lot, okay. of, a lot of scripts That's I read. Alexandria Quartet. Yeah. Great. Thank you all so much. Let's give Georgia and Bob a <laughs>